Good evening, and welcome to a conversation on the book of Form and Emptiness with author Ruth Ozeki and Abbot Shinge Roshi. On behalf of the Zen Center, we thank you for attending this event. The book of Form and Emptiness has been long listed for the 2022 Women's Prize for Fiction. Congratulations. And now it is my honor to introduce our featured speakers this evening. Ruth Ozeki is a novelist and a Zen priest in the Everyday Zen Foundation, where her teacher is the well-known writer, Norman Fisher Roshi. She teaches creative writing at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts, and is the Grace Jarko Ross 1933 Professor of Humanities there. Her last book, A Tale for the Time Being, was a 2013 Booker Award finalist. Reverend Ozeki, a Japanese American Canadian, studied classical Japanese literature and no drama on a Japanese Ministry of Education fellowship after college. She returned to New York and worked in the film and television industry as an art director, set designer, producer, and director, and made several independent films of her own. Her other books include the novels All Over Creation and My Year of Meats, and a short memoir, The Face, A Time Code. Jinge Roshi Sherry Shayat is abbot of the Zen Center of Syracuse and the Zen Study Society. She began formal Zen practice at New York Zendo in 1967 and served as co-director of Daibazatsu Zendo from 1974 until 1976 when she moved to Syracuse and began leading the Zen Center here. She practiced with Mio on Maureen Stewart Roshi until the latter's death in 1990. She received Dharma transmission in 1998 from Edo Shimano Roshi. He authorized her as a Roshi in 2008, giving her the name Shinge, meaning heart, mind, flowering. She has written and edited several books, including Eloquent Silence, Yogen Senzaki's Gateless Gate and other previously unpublished teachings and letters, Endless Vow, The Zen Path of Zoen Nakagawa, with Edo Shimano and Kazuaki Tanahashi, Subtle Sound, The Teachings of Maureen Stewart, and Life Lessons, The Art of Jerome Witkin. Our featured speakers became fast friends after meeting in Northampton a few years ago at the restaurant run by Shinge Roshi's son and daughter-in-law. Shinge Roshi invited Ruth Ozeki to give a reading from A Tale for the Time Being at New York Zendo in 2018 on the occasion of its 50th anniversary celebration. We are delighted they have reunited for this evening's conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chuan, and it's so good to see you again. It's wonderful to see you too. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking it, um, that that time in the restaurant, Belly of the Beast, it yeah. must have been about six years ago or so. Yeah, before everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, before everything. We wouldn't, it, it, impossible to imagine at that time that the world would have changed this much. Yeah. And you were writing the book of form and emptiness for, I think you were working on it then for about eight years. Yeah. So all during the horror of the yeah. Trump era and yeah. so much of the kind of foreboding and dysfunction of that period mm -hmm. uh, appears in some of the more traumatic sections of the book without being actually mm -hmm. named that way. Yeah, I, I've always, I've always felt that, um, you know, I, with some novels it might not be appropriate, but for the kind of novel that I'm writing, um, I want I, I want to keep the pores of the fictional world open, 
you know, so that the so that the world, you know, so that what we call the real world, right, can sort of interpenetrate with the fictional world um, and and affect each other, right? So there's like almost like a conversation going on between what's happening outside, you know, the fictional world, outside the book, and also, and then what's happening inside the book. And and I think I've done that with every, I think I've done that with every novel, um, yeah. allowed allowed the two worlds to, to talk to each other. Um, and this one was, you know, as you say, this was, um, it, it, it requires a certain, kind of agility because as you say, you know, I'd been working on this book since probably 2012, 2013, long before, you know, um, I mean, Trump was still, you know, a talk show host. And, um, and, and so, you know, that was not even on the horizon, at least, you know, any horizon that I could see. But um, then when, and, and so at that time, of course, I was working on the book, but that, you know, those, um, you know, those pieces hadn't yet come into the, you know, into the story. But then when they did, I, I realized when, when that stuff started to happen, you know, in, in 2015, 2016, um, I, I realized that the book needed to change. The book needed to change and to accommodate um, what was going on. And that required quite a bit of, you know, fiddling because of course the whole time frame of the, you know, the chronology of the book, everything needed to be updated to accommodate you know, what was going on in the world. Um, and it's, it's always a little unsettling because one never knows what's going to happen next, you know, before the, I mean, before the book is published, right? So I, of course, had no idea of the pandemic, but if it had taken me a little bit longer to write the book, I think the pandemic would have entered it as well. So right. I'm glad I finished it before, you know. Well, it, it's subtle the way these things occur and, um, make their presence known, mm. almost like a whisper, but you can feel, you can feel there's a kind of dread. There's yeah. certainly a, a, in much of the relationship between the Aleph and Benny, between, mm -hmm. um, yeah, actually all, among, among all the characters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah. I like that a lot. I mean, I think that um, right from the beginning, uh, Benny's mom, well, I knew certain things. I knew that Benny was a little boy who was going to start to hear the voices of things talking, right? Um, but I also knew that his mother, Annabelle, was going to have this, you know, sort of strange job as a media monitor. And so she's also hearing the world talking to her all the time. She's clipping newspapers, she's listening to radio, she's watching television. She starts, you know, she starts over the course of her career, she starts to monitor social media. So she really, you know, has, you know, her ears open. I mean, that's her job is to listen to, you know, to listen to the cries of the world, really, you know. Exactly. Yeah. She too is a canon, although isn't spoken yeah. that way. Yeah. But, um, there really is that sense of, uh, the impinging of the world and all of her, what she calls her life, how she feels she has to keep that going and has to, she can't throw any of it away. And it's a strange kind of hoarding, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it starts with her hoarding, um, you know, her, her husband's clothing, you know, I mean, he, her husband, Kenji, who is, yeah. you know, this, kind of happy-go-lucky jazz musician who, you know, plays klezmer music and, and you know, um, uh, smokes a little bit too much weed, um, you know, he, he, he dies in the first couple of pages of the book. And, um, and this is, this upends the family, you know, I mean, Benny is, um, I think Benny is, if I recall, I think he's 12 at the time. And, um, and, you know, Annabelle Kenji was her, you know, her, her love. And, um, and so she, you know, his clothes are still redolent with, you know, his aura, his smell, his, you know, his being right in the, in the, you know, in the weave of the clothing. And she just can't bring herself to throw this out. So she has all sorts of ideas about making a memory quilt or, you know, one thing after another. Um, but then, yeah, I think that, you know, after a loss like that, I think it becomes hard to let go, 
right? And so she starts to accumulate things, I think, yeah. as in, in response to that loss. I think it's very interesting the way you work with the characters um, with so much compassion. I think if there were three words I would use for this book, it would be wit, wonder, and compassion. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just so lovely the way that the, the warmth of, of the writer comes through. Yeah. And the caring comes through so much. It's so interesting to hear you say this because um, I have I had no problem feeling love and compassion for Benny, mm -hmm. you know, and I had no problem feeling love and compassion for Kenji, even though he's a little bit exasperating and you know probably mm -hmm. should have you know. Um, laid off the, you know, the weed earlier, you know, in his life. Um, also, you know, the other characters like the, you know, the um, Slovenian poet philosopher, right. Slavoj, the bottle man, right? I love, I, you know, had an immediate yes. feeling of love for him. Fabulous. Yeah. And the young artist, the Aleph, but the, um, the person I had the hardest time with was Annabelle. And I think it's because Annabelle is most like me, you mm. know? Um, and so I have no sympathy for myself. And at first it, you know, I had no sympathy for her and it took a long, and, and what I noticed was that, um, you know, the, the, the whole book is set up as a dialogue between the book of form and emptiness, you know, the, the book itself and Benny, right? So Benny and the book are talking to each other. The book is a the speaking object, right? So this Benny and the book are talking to each other and the book narrates Annabelle's sections. Mm. And what happened was that um, I noticed that this, this kind of tone of ironic disparagement mm. tended to creep in at moments when Annabelle was behaving in ways that were like me, right? <laughs> right? And it was kind of a, a tone of what I, what I started to think of as fond contempt, mm -hmm. right? Kind of, you know, a little bit mocking, mm -hmm. but it, it was just, it had an edge to it. And readers, early readers of the book picked up on that immediately. And they said, you know, I don't know what it is about Annabelle, but I just am having trouble relating to her, you know, she, she puts me off. Well, of course, it's not her that's putting, you know, the reader off. It's the book the you know, the tone, the attitude, right. And what happened was that, I mean, this was, you know, this was really interesting, because I recognized that tone, that slightly snarky, little bit ironic, sarcastic tone, as a voice that I hear in my head when I've done something that I think is stupid. Right. And I hear that voice sort of, you know, saying, oh, good, Ruth, you know, well done. You know, mm -hmm. that kind of um, and, and it's very yeah, sarcastic. Yeah. And it's very distancing. So mm -hmm. I had to go in and, you know, and look sentence by sentence, word for word and, you know, rework all of those passages and mm -hmm. until the book could find some real compassion for Annabelle. That's and that was a practice. That, but you know, your process is what makes it so interesting. Yeah. Because I think for the reader, there is that uh, judgmental quality that we feel, you know, what is wrong with her? Why can't she get her act together? Right. Um, right. And then something happens. And it's. Yeah. I think it, it's great that you start almost the cruel voices Benny hears when, that, yeah. that lead him to hurt himself or want to hurt someone else, that, that in a way is uh, happening in a very kind of deep sort of basement level yeah. Yeah. for you and Annabelle and that gets transformed. Yeah. And it's yeah. almost as though she's healing as he is healing. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And, and as I'm healing, you know, right. <laughs> right. because I think this practice is, you know, and, and I've always felt this, that that novel writing is a, you know, and I think this is probably true for any creative act, but it's, you know, that it's an 
active self, you know, self interrogation and to some extent healing, you know, because we always write about the things that, you know, that bother us, right? I mean, that, that we're always drawn to, you know, the, the, you know, it's sort of like the princess and the pea, you know, that, that thing that's under the mattress that's been irritating you all your life, right? And, you you know, I find myself drawn to those, you know, and I've often said that I write out of remorse, that remorse is like that, you know, that, that niggling, uncomfortable thing that I can't forget about, I can't, you know, I can't push it away. And so then I end up, you know, having to kind of confront it in the novel somehow. Yeah, it's really interesting how that kind of niggling thing uh, is also present in why we sit. Exactly. I yeah. think the suffering that we've experienced and the way we've turned it on ourselves yeah. as validation for feeling bad yeah. is yeah. what brings us to the cushion. I was contemplating this, you know, preparing to meet with you this evening. Um, that, you know, really it's both in Zen practice and in writing, we start, we begin in silence. And then, of course, we notice how noisy the mind is. And, and we have to somehow allow our self-preoccupation all the projections, all those inner critics um, to say their piece, but then start to fall away. We can't have a kind of nasty fight with them, right? There's a a process that happens and trust happens. And I think you say somewhere, um, you know, this is a body. We we listen, right? We listen with the whole body, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not the ears. And that listening practice, the voices come. And I've always felt as though in, in Zen at any rate, and I think this is true in writing as well, it's as though the voices, they're heard indistinctly and then there's a doorway. If we just stay with it and, and keep listening, there's a doorway that opens to a secret garden And what's growing there? The story truths that want to be to be seen. First, at first, they're 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 still you know hard like beans, shells, concept shells, and then they start becoming who and what they are. So, I was really glad to hear you speak a little bit about how this book began thinking about Benny, hearing Benny. It's such a mysterious process because you have to be open. You're listening. You're letting something happen, right? Yeah. And yet you're guiding. You can't control yeah. and you have to guide or you can't write. And, and so there's that tension always you have to be present. So it's so much like meditation. We have to be yeah. learning this skill of, um, we might call it luminous alertness. Yes. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes. Or yeah. t- attention without tension, you know. Yeah. And, right. and receiving without categorizing, because that's the other thing that gets in the way. Yeah, yeah. That's so beautiful. Um, and, and that's very much the way that, I love the way that you describe, um, you know, the sort of entrance into the garden, you know, and um, this, I, this sense that there's something there, but if you turn your attention too directly onto it mm-hmm. and you try too hard, you try to grasp it, you try to reach after it and hold on to it, 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 it slips through your fingers, it slips through your awareness, right? And, and so there's a, um, and, and it's interesting because I've always described this and I, you know, describe this to my students this way too, that, um, you know, that writers are impatient, right? Mm-hmm. We, we want, we don't like to write as much as we like to have written, right? <laughs> um, and so, you know, so there's this, 
there's this tension, you know, between, I mean, when, as you say, when we start out with the empty page, we don't know anything, right? So there's this not knowing. And then we really, really, really want to know. We want to know what's happening with the story. So, you know, patience and impatience, knowing and not knowing. And, and there's this kind of tension that is, you know, that, that um, you know, exists between those two poles. And that tension in itself, I think, is the generative tension, mm-hmm. right? That fuels any kind of creative act, you know. And and so the trick is to learn to sit. And this is what I, you know, I tell my writing students, you know, to to sit comfortably, as comfortably as you can, to relax into that tension and allow it to be, rather than you know, grasping to you know, too quickly at, at some easy solution, right? Mm-hmm. Or, um, you know, an easy cliche, right? No, you, you can't grasp for an easy cliche. You, you, you know, you wait and listen with your whole body until right. the right words come, right? And they will come if you wait, right? So it's so beautiful the way that you've, you know, you've laid out this, you know, the, the parallels between, um, between the writing process and the and, and Zazen practice. And, and it's true, too, in Zazen practice, when you're working with koans, there is that tension. And there is a yeah. the need to be willing to keep yourself empty in order to become intimate with yeah. the koan. Yeah. But again, impatience rears up. Yeah. You want to solve it. Yeah. The bottle man talks about that... Um, um, let me see if I can find it. It's such a, it's a wonderful section. Maybe you know what I'm talking about, where he talks about poetry and the problem of yeah. words. And yeah, I wonder- if you want a solution, you know, here it is. Uh, maybe you'd like to read this little section. Sure. Only it's on... Um, he starts at the bottom of page 276. There it is, yeah. Um, oh yes, okay. So this is the this is the the Slovenian uh, poet philosopher. He's he's homeless uh, poet philosopher in a wheelchair, and um, he and Benny are in the basement of. Uh, the library and it's nighttime and it's a little bit mysterious how they manage to access the staff room at the library but the bottle man knows everybody he's got contacts right um, and so they're down there and they're alone and the bottle man is is writing and he's got this stack of, of paper um, on on this desk in this in the staff room and Benny so I'll just read this a little bit um, he's working on a poem okay Um, Benny eyed a short stack of paper on the desk. Are those poems too? Nah, the poet said, despondent, only empty pages. He moved the top sheet aside, and indeed, the pages underneath were blank. He pointed to the floor, where a large drift of crumpled paper balls had accumulated by the wheel of his chair, and shook his head ruefully. Let me tell you something about poetry, young schoolboy. Poetry is a problem of form and emptiness. The moment I put one word onto an empty page, I have created a problem for myself. The poem that emerges is form, trying to find a solution to my problem. He sighed. In the end, of course, there are no solutions, only more problems. But this is a good thing. Without problems, there would be no more poems. (laughs) Uh, I I love that. And um, and then there's that other section that I told you I thought it would be wonderful. Oh it yeah, yeah. Follows it not so far after that in the bindery. Yes. Which yes. in itself is a wonderful word, isn't it, for yeah. the book? Yeah. The way we're bound, the way the bindery, the way books have to be cared for and bound, and now there aren't any more. It's just all computerized, digital. All computerized. Yeah. So anyway, if you yeah, for that, so I read that. Yes, yes. Well, and again, just to set it up a little bit. So this library, um, in the basement of this library, is this. Um, uh, it, it's a defunct bindery, and um, 
And in the bindery are all of these, you know, it, it, the machines are still there, the sewing machines and the bind, you know, and the guillotine cutters and, and stacks of paper everywhere. Um, but the library is in the process of, you know, digitizing the collections. And so they don't need, you know, to bind them anymore. Um, and so Benny has been uh, sent in to the bindery by the bottle man um, to, to find some paper because there's, you know, there's paper all over the place there. For his own book, um, right? For his own book, that's right, that's right. Because Benny is now going to write stories himself. He's going to try anyway. No. Um, and so uh, I'll just read this a little bit. The bindery contains everything, the bottle man had said. Anything is possible. And now Benny understood. The bindery was a primordial place, a place of vast, boundless silence that contained all sound and emptiness that contained all form. Benny had never heard such silence before, never felt such imminence. He shivered. Paper, he reminded himself, just get the paper and get out. But everywhere he turned, it seemed there was more of it. Shelves piled with it, cubby holes filled with it, desks and tables stacked high with reams of it. There was paper everywhere. And as he stood there in the green light cast by the emergency exit sign, the leaves and sheets began to whisper like the wind in the trees that had been rendered into pulp and pressed into the service of meaning to give form to the ineffable. He could hear their voices speaking, and then suddenly he could see them too, all the wild, unbound words like a frenzied cloud of dust motes spinning and dancing around him in the dim green light. He'd never seen words behave like this before, and the sight undid him. The world began to tip, but just as he started to fall, he heard a faint voice, like a gust of warm air rising from the maelstrom, tentative, hesitant, and strangely hopeful. A book must start somewhere. It was a voice like no other. <laughs> and indeed, at the beginning of your book, yeah. right? Yep. The very first, yeah. And this is the way, shall I go ahead and read that, that beginning section? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is the way the, the, the book starts, right? And, the, and it's, it's the book speaking, although you don't really know yet. In the beginning, a book must start somewhere. One brave letter must volunteer to go first, laying itself on the line in an act of faith from which a word takes heart and follows drawing a sentence into its wake. From there, a paragraph amasses and soon a page and the book is on its way, finding a voice, calling itself into being. A book must start somewhere and this one starts here. <laughs> yes, wonderful. Yeah. You know, so that I... scene- <laughs> No, go ahead. That, oh, that scene in the bindery is where, um, where Benny, you know, in, in story time, in the story time of the book, where Benny first hears the book starting to speak to him, right? So those two sections kind of meet up at that moment. Right. And the book, or your narration, and his book start yeah. at that point. That's right. That's right. Yeah. The other thing I, I wanted to mention that I love so much in the book is the way um, objects are heard and cared for and listened to. And in a way, Annabelle, in her, in her own way, is doing that, is rescuing things. Yeah. And, and objects are loved in different ways throughout the book. And there's that lovely passage that I think is probably autobiographical of Corey and rescuing from a dumpster her grandmother's small empty box. That's on 496. I don't know if, if you want to read that little section or just yeah. talk about it as well. I'll just you yeah. I'll tell you where that story comes from. Um, yeah. You know, Corey is the librarian um, who ends up. You know, she's a children's librarian and she ends up um, sort of helping the family. Um, and, and she, you know, when when um, when her grandmother dies, uh, she 
um, inherits this box that's, you know, labeled with the words empty box, right? And, and so this is a very precious thing for her. And, um, and this was actually, as you say, it, it was an autobiographical um, moment because when my mom died, uh, you know, I, I'm an only child and I was tasked with, you know, um, really just sort of dealing with all of their stuff. And my parents were, um, you know, they were born um, in 1914. So they lived through the depression and that really changed people. And um, so they were, they weren't hoarders, but they kept everything. <laughs> and, you know, every piece of, um, you know, every piece of tin foil had to be washed and folded. Um, every piece of saran wrap, same thing, washed and folded and put away for, you know, future use. And, um, and all this, you know, this stuff had accumulated in the house that they were saving and, and they were very careful with it. But, you know, as they got older and older, it became harder and harder for them too. Um, so in any case, I, you know, uh, the task fell to me to, to um, dispose of all of this um, and to, uh, you know, to, to uh, clear out the house and sell it. And um, one of the things that I found that um, was this little box, you know, about, about this size and on it, written on it in my mother's handwriting in both English and in Japanese, right, was the word empty box. And then in Japanese, it was karabako, right? So empty box and karabako. And, and I opened it up and sure enough, it's empty, right? Yeah. <laughs> and this was the most perplexing thing in the world. I mean, talk about a riddle, you know, this is the most perplexing thing because now what am I supposed to do with this empty box, right? I can't put anything in it because if I put something in it, then I turn it into precisely what it's not. Right. And so it becomes this problem. So, of course, I, you know, ended up putting it on my altar because, you know, what else are you going to do with it? Right. It's so. like a talisman for the book. It is. It is. It really is. It really is. <laughs> and I love the way objects have agency. And, yeah. you know, if we listen, we know what they're asking. And um, that leads into the Marie Kondo character. Yeah. Um, how her book, Tidy Magic, you know, that that's a wonderful title, magic, you know, the Japanese syllable myo. Yeah. Wondrous. Yeah. yeah. Mysterious, subtle. Yeah. That caring, listening to objects and hearing what they want is so antithetical to the way our culture operates yeah. where we you know we're trained to throw things out when things get you know they're not as pretty or, or something they don't function quite you know I'm also the product of a family from the depression era yeah. and I don't throw anything out yeah. my students who have helped me in my house have walked away going oh how does she live there <laughs> but it, but I always feel this way. There's a kind of reverence for yeah. these so-called material objects. And your teacher, uh, Zoketsu Roshi, Norman Fisher, his, his latest book is titled, When You Greet Me, I Bow. Yeah. And to me, that's what we ought to be doing all the time, not just to humans, yeah. not just to yeah. animals, but to, you know, a little piece of cellophane that's been washed and pressed and folded. Yeah. And of course, the empty box. Yeah. Yeah. To have a, a sense of awe. Yeah. Rather than rushing through our lives, and this is what happens, things break yeah. because we're not having that awe for that so-called object. Or we lose our keys because, you know, they get, we're distracted yeah. or forgetful, whatever. So all of this is leading me to tell you that when I was thinking about the book and, and just feeling quite in love with it mm. during this second reading again, I remembered a koan that Actually, Dogen uses as one of his 300 koans. It's about Tozan Ryokai, who's co-founder of the Soto School. So you know it. Um, he, he went to Isan and he said, I've heard that Chu 
Kokushi, the national teacher, taught that insentient creatures expound the Dharma. I'm not clear about it. And Isan said, sermons by insentient creatures are given here for us too. A few can hear them. Tozan said, would you please teach me about this? Isan said nothing. He just raised his hosu, his whisk. Tozan said, I don't get it. Would you please explain? Isan said, I am completely unable to tell you using the mouth that my parents gave me. Go to Master Ungong's place. <laughs> same thing, same question. Why can't I hear them? Same gesture. Do you hear it? No. Then Ungan said, don't you know the flower garland sutra says birds and trees all chant Buddha, all chant Dharma. Upon hearing this, Tozan had a breakthrough. And he, you, you may remember this verse, he wrote, wonderful. <laughs> sermons by insentient creatures you fail to hear if you listen with your ears listen with your eyes and you hear them so this is what i felt all through the book that there was this kind of listening going on this full-bodied listening and increasingly a sense of reverence mm -hmm. and that Annabelle finally mm -hmm. can feel that. Yeah. yeah. That is the, that is the koan that's at the heart of the book. Um, you know, it was the koan that I was, um, you know, I was sitting with uh, mm -hmm. throughout the, throughout the writing of the whole book. I think it was, you know, I could even say it was the koan that inspired the book, Yeah. Um, you know, and and so it's it's wonderful that you know it's it it's submerged of course because you know most readers would not see that would not hear that but you know but but I, I'm so happy that that you could feel that you know the presence of that gone there. Yeah. I'm so glad that I, you know it was a, a wonderful um, re I don't know uh, reconnecting for me mm -hmm. with that gone reading the book yeah. and yeah. your um, at your practice is so clearly felt without ever being didactic. Mm. You're never <laughs> preaching. And you look like a crazy young woman teach Benny. Yeah. And you let Benny come to his own realizations. And, mm. and so I, I really feel that that is the secret to the greatness of the book mm -hmm. that it is submerged but that it comes through in ways that no one would ever say oh yeah she is a buddhist teaching and yeah. you know preaching and whatever yeah yeah i'm i'm so again i'm so glad to hear you say that because um that's something that uh i've worked really hard on not just with this book but with um previous books as well um you know, the, the first two books that I wrote were really um, concerned with uh, problems in the, you know, in the food supply chain, you know, yes. and environmental problems. Um, and I, these were things that bothered me for various reasons, um, you know, and, and so I wanted to spend some time, you know, really going deep into the, you know, into the problems themselves and, and how did I feel about it and you know, I had been complicit in this kind of thing because I had worked for television. And, um, and so how did I feel about making advertising for, you know, the meat industry, you know, at one point in my career, you know, and um, this is what I mean about writing from remorse. But so there was always this, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you process or investigate this, you know, this kind of material mm -hmm. and then share it in a story form without being didactic, right? And because the, the one 
the, the biggest sin in, in a novel is, you know, that kind of didacticism because people will just slam the book and, you know, it's, it's kind of like a sneaky Trojan horse thing. And as soon as people <laughs> sniff it out, they, they you know, it, there's a, you know, a huge pushback against that. And I don't feel didactic when I'm writing it. I mean, I guess that's part of the, the um, because I am really trying to figure this out myself, right? Yeah, and, and so it's my own, you know, it's my own kind of struggle you know, uh, that, that is on the page. And, um, and it's not coming from a preachy place. It's coming from a place of, you know, like, how do I make sense of this? How do I, you know, what can I do to discover this or to go deep more deeply into it? You know, how can I express this? Right. Um, the, the, the struggle itself or the, you know, the, the, you know, the attempt at understanding. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think, but it's something that I've been conscious of, you know, um, uh, from a writerly point of view, um, you know, because uh, I really wanted to kind of keep that tone out of, you know, of the book. So I'm, I'm really happy to hear that you, know, that you think that that was successful. Yeah, the message comes through in such a natural way, without ever feeling that it's superimposed, you know. And um, I think using a young boy, using a 12 year old boy, who's suffering so much, is a great way to have that happen because he's educated throughout the book, you know, by the most unlikely people. He never goes to school, you know, when he goes to the library, he just sleeps on the books. So <laughs> right. education is the bottle man and the Aleph and, and it's a great education. So what you do is, it is um, just that very generous form of, making everyone else care about the things you care about. Mm, 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 that yeah. happened in the last book too, I think for me, a tale for the time being, you know, it was obvious your Zen practice was there, but it, it was more a question of revealing um, the underlying connections, um, you know, the intertwining mm. characters and, um, and of course, all of it was rooted in Dogen's being time. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you about, you told me on the phone the other day about being invited to a conference in Kyoto. <laughs> with, um, the scholars, Dogen scholars, and there you were, the only <laughs> novelist in this tradition of commentary literature on Dogen's work. So what was that like? Yeah, no, that was the craziest thing. Um, uh, my colleague here at Smith is Jay Garfield, um, who is a, you know, a renowned Tibetan, um, you know, Buddhist scholar. And, um, and he's very good friends with uh, a, a Dogen scholar in, in uh, Kyoto at Kyoto University. And um, so they were, you know, there was going to be this international Dogen conference and, and Jay, who uh, Jay is very difficult to say no to, you know, he, he, he's so, he's really enthusiastic and he's just so, he, he's just the most wonderful guy. And, and he, you know, he, he invites you to do things. And when he says it, it seems possible, you know, it, it seems like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll go to this international Dogen conference. And then afterwards you step back and you think, what did I just say? What did I just agree to? And that's what happened there. But, you know, having agreed, I had to go. Um, and I went and I was, I was scared. I was really scared because I thought, you know, I, I'm just a novelist. I mean, and I've written this book and that's great and everything, but, um, you know, these are like serious people. And, um, and I went to the first session and, you know, and they acknowledged that I was there and they thanked me for the work and they talked about it. And they, anyway, they started to discuss it. And, um, and they were discussing it in the context of commentary literature. They were discussing it as if it were context, you know, as, was, as if it were commentary literature on, you know, Dogen's Uji, right? And, um, and I just sat there and listened. I mean, thank goodness they didn't ask me anything because, you know, um, but I just sat there and listened. And little by little, it, I, I started to understand that even though I hadn't meant it as commentary literature, of course, that's what it is. You know, and there's a long, you know, hundreds of years of tradition of Zen practitioners, you know, commenting in artistic form, in creative form, either usually through poetry, not yeah. through long novels, right, but um, in, in poetic form to 
you know, the other pieces of, of Zen commentary. And this is something that, um, you know, that the book talks about as well, the way that all books talk to each other, yes, right? Yes, and, yes. and so there's this kind of rhizomatic network that, that right. connects all books and they all talk to each other, you know, underground, right? And I think that's obviously that's true for the, you know, the Zen teachings as well, that all of the Zen teachings are talking to each other, right? And, and of course, I mean, as I said, I didn't mean to do that, but that's, you know, just, you know, through the, uh, the writing of this and through the, you know, the, the contemplation of the, you know, of the fascicle, um, I ended up doing it, even though, you know, I hadn't intended to. So I was, I was, you know, I was scared. And also really, um, you know, that was an education. <laughs> oh, I bet. I bet. Yeah. So it all worked out very well. You it all worked out in the end. Yeah. yeah. To present anything, your book was doing what it needed. That was it. Your eyes. That's, right. That's so great. That's right. Yeah. Right. And they made me feel very welcome and, you know, as if I actually knew something. So I, I was really grateful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, I know that, that um, there are two other writers that were very important in this book. Um, the book of form and emptiness, at least two. Well, I also thought about Yeats in terms of how one works, you know, a vision not that you were actually doing automatic writing, but that there is that, you know, that in that quality of listening, yeah. what is the voice that wants to be um, conveyed into the story in some fashion? But of course, the main ones I think are um, Walter Benjamin, mm -hmm. uh, who appears quite frequently, the frontispiece yeah. and, and several other places in the book. Um, from his work, Unpacking My Library. And then, of course, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, the story of the Aleph and other stories. And in fact, the fictional character, Slavoj, who is a seer in, in a way, a Yeats tradition. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And um, as we mentioned already, Tidy Magic, yeah. how that book has its own way of demanding attention, jumping into a shopping cart, <laughs> flinging itself in front of Annabelle when she most needs it. And all of these, um, th these interweaving books, I just love that, uh, that, layer upon layer and conversation among these mm -hmm. books with the book. Yeah. But I, I wanted to ask you particularly about uh, Benjamin and oh. why, you know, how he figures for you in your own development as a writer. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I had read uh, Walter Benjamin in college, you know, and I had my you know, copies of Illuminations and, you know, uh, whatever else is on the, you know, on the shelf. And, um, and I think, you know, things like, you know, the work of art uh, in the age of mechanical reproduction was something that, you know, was a seminal essay that I had read that, you know, sort of informed my thinking, but I'd forgotten about it, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, the way that one does, right. And, um, and so then, uh, when I was writing this, um, well, first of all, I had this rule, you know, at the beginning, we talked about keeping the walls of the fictional world porous, right? And I had this rule that when somebody told me about something or gave me something, or I overheard something that was, you know, that kind of made me, you know, sort of pay attention, that I would put it into the book, I would give it to the book and put it into the book and see what happened, right? And so I did this with various things. Like, for example, I did it with, I know I'm getting off topic, but I'm not really. Um, oh. A friend of mine gave me this. Oh, right? the snow globe, very much yeah. on topic. Wow, right? it's a yeah. beautiful yeah. one. Yeah, so she came back from, uh, you know, a trip and she, she gave me this. And I thought, oh, this is perfect because this is exactly the kind of thing that Annabelle would love. And so I, you know, I gave it to Annabelle um, and then, you know, before I knew it, Annabelle was on eBay, 
you know, buying more snow globes. And then, you know, the Aleph in her art studio was making these disaster snow globes. And so the snow globe kind of image proliferated, right? So that was interesting. And I did that with several other objects, you know, and overheard pieces of conversation too. And then here we get back to, Do uh, to, to Benjamin. Um, you know, the part of the book is set, a, a large part of the book is set in this library. And it's about, you know, our relationship with books. And so a friend of mine said, you know, have you read Walter Benjamin's essay, Unpacking My Library? So of course, immediately, you know, that becomes, that has to come into the, you know, I read it and it was just perfect, right? I mean, it was just, yeah. it was so clearly describing this relationship that, you know, that people have with books, um, you know, that I could kind of play with, right? The, the, you know, is, is, you know, is the, are people, is it the person who's collecting the book or is it the book who's collecting the person, right? right? This idea of agency going backwards and forwards, right? And it just, it was just so perfect. And so I put, um, I started using epigraphs, um, you know, from unpacking my library. And Walter Benjamin became a kind of um, almost like ghostly um, companion figure, you know, to the book. And then I, then I started thinking about it and I thought, well, of course, Slavos, the, the bottle man, would know Benjamin's work. And so then before you, and, and, and of course I was now, um, I'd gone down a Walter Benjamin rabbit hole and was reading everything I could get my hands on, right? Um, and so then Slavos starts talking about Walter Benjamin and, um, and especially there's a section um, on, in the mountain, right? Mm -hmm. Where um, the, the bottle man starts to talk about how Walter Benjamin was escaping from France over the Pyrenees, um, you know, uh, he was escaping, you know, the Gestapo, and um, and he was carrying a briefcase with his final manuscript in it. And he, you know, as he's crossing the pyramids with a small group of people, um, you know, he tells them that this manuscript is more important than my life. Um, and he makes it across, you know, the Pyrenees into this port town in Spain, and just as the border is closing. Right. And so he's not going to be allowed to get the exit papers he needs um, to, to leave Spain. And that night he kills himself. Right. And the manuscript disappears. Right. So this is a true story. And this is a story that um, Slavos is telling. Um, but so much of, you know, it, it goes back to this idea of, again, the world kind of coming into the book. Um, you know, where this was, you know, during the Trump era where there is, you know, there's really a sense of a growing fascist movement, um, not just in the US, but globally. And now we're really seeing, you know, one of the manifestations of that, right? And so I just felt like, well, let Benjamin into this book, let him, you know, let, let that story be told, right? Um, and so, so that happened. And Meanwhile, I'm also reading Walter Benjamin's um, letters to Adorno and Adorno's letter, really Adorno's letters to Walter Benjamin. And in those letters, I suddenly come across this mention, Adorno mentions Walter Benjamin's snow globe collection, right? And it was just one of those, you know, heart stopping moments where I, I just thought, I could not make this up. I didn't make it up. This, you know, this is a gift. Um, you know, if somehow these two worlds collided, you know, and this is, and this is what I mean about, you know, I, to me, to my mind, you know, the, the movement from emptiness into form is mm -hmm. exactly this. It's this, you know, this kind of constellating of elements, right that that start to come together and they start to constellate and then they and then from that something you know something is born right and then that something of course will also dissipate back into its elements but uh at least for the time being you know there it is right and that's that was the feeling um that i had when i read this uh you know this letter from theodore adorno to to walter benjamin and it was um you know it was just a, a powerful moment you know, where it, I just felt like this is, you know, you know, I've experimented with different ways of writing and this idea of just allowing things in, you know, mm -hmm. to use Dogen's phrase, you know, to be all inclusive, you know, to really allow the world in um, that, yeah, this is a good way to write this book. Mm -hmm. 
you know. It certainly was just perfect. I mean, that's magic. And that's it is. Yeah. gay magic. And yeah. and that gets back to, you know, nonsense, ordinary mind is the way. Yeah. What yeah. we think doesn't matter, matters completely. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Wow, what a wonderful place to stop. I don't know if there's another little section you want to read before we end up with our... Well, how much... Um, we have about a half an hour. Half an hour? Oh, good. Okay, well, I can... Um, and, and we'll move to uh, questions. I hope people have them. Um, let's see. I thought I could... I thought I might read just a little... You know, because the, there's this character of Icon, who is the kind of Marie Kondo oh, character. Yeah. That, let's end with that. Shall I do that? Okay. Um, so, so Icon is this Marie Kondo character, but you know, Marie Kondo was really influenced more by um, by, by Shintoism, right? But mm -hmm. she comes from, you know, she's Japanese, and you know, in Japan, the religions, you know, interpenetrate in wonderful ways, right? And um, and, and so Marie Kondo's approach to, to cleaning, which has become such a global phenomenon, is something that I really related to both culturally, but also because of the Zen, you know, because of the Zen teachings. Um, so in any case, this, this character icon ha kind of moves into the book and um, is, you know, or at least her, her book, Tidy Magic, kind of moves in. Um, and then, but she there are also... She does. Moments. Yeah. She, she does too. The real character. Yeah. Not that's right. Book. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And so that that's and so you know because her book entered you know entered the book, um, icon followed right. And so suddenly there's you know there's scenes at the temple right. And we learn her story. We learn how she was a corporate. Um, you know she worked for a, a you know a, a magazine fashion magazine, and she had a kind of moment of understanding that. Um, you know, that her, her life was empty. Um, and she, uh, and this happened in a, in a, um, you know, in, in the garden of a temple. And, um, and so she shaved her head and, you know, showed up at the temple and asked to be taken in. And she's sent then to take care of an elderly, um, an elderly uh, abbot at a very, very small temple in, um, in, uh, in Tokyo. And um, he's dying. Right, and so this is this is one of the scenes, um, and in this scene, Icon is uh, she's lying. This is after his death, right? Um, she's lying in bed, and she's listening to the outside world, the noise, and um, she's really stressed out because her book is doing really well, and <laughs> she's going to have to <laughs> she's going to have to do like book tours and you know all of these things, right? Um, and so she's trying to sleep, but she's got insomnia. Okay. So um, the media group that published her book in Japan was pressing her to do a TV show. The U.S. publishers wanted her to do an author tour. Her nuns needed training. Her growing congregation needed attention. And she had signed a contract for a new book that she had no time to write. She'd left corporate life in order to get away from this kind of pressure. But the stress had followed her here, right? <laughs> Reflexively, she glanced toward the altar where Kannon sat serenely on her lotus, moonlight limbing her eleven heads. Her thousand arms emanated from her body like an aureole of chrysanthemum petals, each one bearing an eye on its palm or holding a tool of enlightenment. When Icon was still a novice monk, dusting all those intricately carved tools, the mirrors, axes, jewels, beads, flowers, bells, wheels, whisks, swords, bows, and arrows, she often wondered why Kannon needed so much stuff to save all beings from suffering. Why couldn't she dispel greed, hatred, and delusion with less clutter? She had asked her teacher this question once before he died, when she was writing a chapter on the desire for material possession. Her teacher was lying on his futon, and he didn't answer at first, and she wondered if he'd even heard her, but then he stirred and then he stirred, turning his head to look at the statue. When he spoke, his voice was so soft, she had to strain to hear it. Kanon is a lady, he said. Ladies like pretty things. 
The familiar spark of anger flared up in her breast and made her cheeks burn. He was an old man, a Zen master, and he was dying, but that was no excuse for this kind of sexism. She took a deep breath and was about to protest when he turned his head and she saw that he was smiling. She exhaled. Of course, he knew just which buttons to push. Do you know how Senju Kannon got her thousand arms? He asked. And when she said she didn't, he nodded slowly. Well then, he said, closing his eyes, I will tell you. A long time ago, Kannon, the Bodhisattva of compassion, made a deep vow to free all beings and help us wake up to our true and luminous nature. His words were like beads on the string of a mala, escaping his lips in small puffs of air. Kannon was like you. She worked so hard, but there were always more beings trapped in delusion. She heard their pitiful cries, and she became so distressed that one day her head exploded. He paused, opened his eyes wide, and looked at her. You don't believe me? Well, it did. It broke into 11 pieces, so now she had 11 heads. How wonderful. He was sounding livelier, almost like his old self. But 11 heads, still not enough. There were too many beings to hold in her arms, and she kept reaching and reaching until her arms exploded too. They split into a thousand pieces, so now she had a thousand new arms and a thousand new hands, and each hand had an eye in its palm. He closed his eyes again. This is why she's called the sound observer, he said, sighing, the one who can hear the cries of the world. His voice trailed off, but his words hung in the air like the fragrance from a stick of incense. So that now, even now, two years later, Icon could still hear the echoes in the darkness. She could relate to Kanon, all her nuns could. They were all overachievers with exploding heads, and this was not a good thing. Or was it? Her assistant, Kimi, had a corporate job in an international ad agency where she put in so much overtime that at the age of 32, she suffered a heart attack and collapsed at her desk. Maybe at that moment, her heart exploded into a thousand pieces, a thousand hearts to better love the world. Yes, Icon thought, Kimi was a true bodhisattva and her English skills were excellent. It was time to give her more responsibilities. <laughs> she could feel her teacher's presence in the room. Go ahead, she thought, laugh all you want. I'm saving the temple, aren't I? She looked up at Kannon and pressed her palms together over her heart. And then she closed her eyes and slept. Mm. <laughs> Such a wonderful passage to <laughs> end with. Thank you. So I think um, now we'll hear from Choen with some Good. of the questions that appear in the Q&A. Uh, yes, can you hear me okay? Now yes. Uh, for, we have a question from the residents at HoNG and they ask, can you say more about the bindery? Ah. The bindery, um, you know, in uh, the bindery serves different purposes um, the, uh, in the story, you know. Um, historically, it is, you know, the place where um, uh, periodicals would be bound into volumes, right? Um, this was, you know, before the age of digitization. Um, it was also the place where um, books would be repaired. You know, if the spine of the book um, was broken, um, it would be repaired. Um, and of course, you know, little by little, uh, these kinds of services, binding services, no longer um, were needed. And so all of it started to be outsourced, right, to independent bindaries. And all of the public, most libraries used to have bindaries in the basement. Um, and so all of these bindaries um, were closed, right? Um, and Vancouver, in Vancouver, Canada, um, the last public library bindery in North America um, was closed, I think, in probably 2000. And 
I'm not sure if I'm going to get it right, 2006, 2007. Um, and at that time, before it was, um, you know, before, before they deaccessioned all of the, the equipment, um, I was on a, I was given a tour of the, the bindery and was, um, you know, was just amazed at the beauty of these machines. They were, you know, they were antique, um, you know, board cutters from Italy and, you know, these old black sewing, heavy duty industrial sewing machines, you know, strung with threads and these reams of paper, you know, and, and you know, the, the board used for, um, for book covers, you know, and canvas and all of this material, you know, pots of glue. And it was just really, really beautiful, powerful place. Um, and I just, you know, was thinking about all the, the history of, of book binding. And, um, and it struck me that it was a beautiful metaphor, you know, for um, the, well, certainly for the, you know, the idea of writing, right? The idea that, that words are, you know, words are unbound, you know, they're, they're out in the world um, and they're unbound and, and, you know, they come together, again, to use this word constellate, they come together, they constellate, and they turn into, you know, to books that then are bound, right? And they're kind of held in place, at least temporarily, until they, you know, until they break or, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, disintegrate or whatever. Um, and so, so I was thinking about um, how this book in particular, because it's a conversation between, you know, Benny and his book, and the whole, um, the whole thrust of the story is about the emergence out of emptiness, right? Of this, the form of yeah. this, right? A book, right? Um, and about how books are, um, they're, they're really not what they seem either, you know, that, that um, uh, so in any case, to go back to the bindery, that, you know, that the, the bindery is the place that, you know, sort of where metaphorically this can happen, right? But of course, that applies to everything, right? That applies to, um, you know, uh, to the way that, you know, that energies, that material constellates and, you know, and becomes form and then, you know, um, becomes emptiness again, right? And this constant flux, um, and um, so in any case, that the, the, that's the place where the bindery, um, that's the power that the bindery has, you know, metaphorically in the book. And Benny visits the bindery um, a couple times in the book and each time um, has a, a real um, kind of awakening experience. Um, and uh, so that's, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of the, uh, one of the overriding metaphors, I think, of the book. Thank you. Yeah. And then we have another question from the residents at HONG. Mm -hmm. uh, when you say you are trying to figure it out for yourself, is there an example? I'm thinking of the conversations between Benny and the bookman or, or bottleman, I think, or any yeah. of the others as examples of trying to explore. I think that's exactly right. Um, it's almost like, sometimes I think about, um, a book as a kind of thought experiment, you know, um, and this, the scenes, the various scenes, the bits of dialogue, the actions of the characters, um, the way the characters respond to something emotionally. Um, uh, sometimes it's even just through the language that, that you know, that I, it's, it's kind of like what I said earlier about, um, you know, when we were talking about the similarities between uh, you know, uh, sitting zazen or working with a koan, for example. And, you know, when you're trying too hard, too directly, right, um, you lose, yeah. you know, the, the, the meaning escapes, right? The, the, um, the experience kind of dissipates. And, um, and so through these conversations that the characters are having through their actions, it's a way of, um, exploring it, but not in a uh, discursive way, right? Mm -hmm. It's a way of trying to find a way into the problem that, or to the, to the question um, that is not coming from a discursive rational place. It's coming from, um, you know, more like, I mean, to use a Jungian, you know, Jungian terms, more like from the unconscious, right? Um, and so uh, when I'm writing, it's, I don't really, 
um, I don't really plan things. Um, it's, it's more like, you know, what it feels like to me is that um, the characters are making decisions on their own, right? The characters are, um, you know, finding words to express their feelings in the moment, um, that they're, yeah, they're making decisions that might come as a complete surprise to me often. Um, and, and when that starts to happen, that's when I know that, you know, that's when I know that that the experiment, that the thought experiment is working, you know, um, okay. because the characters have taken on a kind of life force of their own. Right. Yeah. Does that, is, is, I think that's what you were kind of describing, Roshi, when at, at one point in our conversation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it becomes so vibrant, the voice. It's not something that, that the writer is putting in the mouths yeah. of the characters any longer. Right, right, right. And And whenever I do try to put words into the mouths of the characters, um, I, I usually fail um, because it doesn't, you know, that's the time where it doesn't, yeah, it just doesn't ring, it doesn't ring true. Um, so it's a, it's a very, well, it, it reminds me of um, that beautiful line in the poem by Emily Dickinson, tell, tell all the truth, but tell it slant, mm. right? And, and so this idea of, you know, you know, sort of not approaching something head on in a kind of rational discursive way, um, you're still telling the truth, but you're, you know, you're really allowing it to emerge, right? And, and, and so you're telling it slant, right? I love that line. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And here's a, another question. Is the bottle man a reference to real life <laughs> philosopher Slavoj Zizek? Busted. Yes, of course. <laughs> and and did, and did his real life work and personality influence the Bottleman's character? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, um, I, I Zizek is. Uh, I I think he's fascinating, and um, I love watching. You know, he's got lots and lots of videos. Um, he's kind of a YouTube you know, philosopher star and, you know, celebrity and, um, or, or influencer. Um, and, and he's just, he's just fascinating to me. And he does a lot of, I've, I've been, you know, sort of reading him and, and watching him um, for, for years. Uh, he's done such an amazing amount of work on, um, you know, he's a Marxist, first of all. And so his, his work on, um, you know, uh, on ideology and, you know, the ideology of the marketplace is, is really interesting. But he also, you know, he's also a, a, a film buff and, and works a lot with, um, you know, with uh, popular media. Um, and so um, I guess just over the years watching him, um, you know, certain mannerisms kind of, because he's, he's very idiosyncratic and certain mannerisms, um, you know, sort of, uh, uh, appealed to me and and started to kind of you know um, appear in in Slavos the, the 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 bottle man at first I have to confess that the bottle man's name uh, wasn't Slavos at first um, but then the the bottle man started acting more and more like Zizek and and I just realized I should just give him you know I should just share the name um, and and you know and so that's that's how he was christened uh, he was christened uh, Slavos. Um, but it, it, he's an, it, he did this beautiful, um, uh, this, there's this beautiful video that, you know, is, is in one of his um, films, but you can sometimes find it online. Um, and in it, he's uh, walking around the Fresh Kills, um, you know, uh, garbage, um, you know, what is it called? Um, you know, massive uh, garbage site. Um, and in, in, um, in New York and he's wandering around, um, you know, these, you know, and, and looking at all of the garbage that's being, you know, from the city that's just being, you know, shipped in. And, um, he's just on this kind of rant about how we really have to learn to love our garbage, right? We have to learn to love our trash, um, and that there's no hope for the world unless we can do that. And, mm -hmm. and there was something about that that was really, um, it was really powerful. Hmm. Yeah. So yes, I'm glad. I'm glad somebody has caught that reference. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Yeah. And what insights can Zen and literature offer in a time of collapse and turmoil? Yeah, I know, right? Well, 
Well, Certainly. you know, we do our we do our best. Right? Stay with it, we, right? Yeah. Stay with it. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, we do we do our best, and we use the you know the tools um, and the means that we have. Um, and I, this has been something that has you know over the years really plagued me because you know I mean it's I've been noticing that the world is in turmoil for you know a good part of my life, and um, and you know so I've always felt torn between the various um, responses that might be possible um and for uh you know for a while um i was really drawn to activism work um but to be you know to, to be perfectly honest i'm not a very good activist um it, it's just some people are and i know many wonderful skilled activists my husband for one is a wonderful activist um but i'm not um I, I don't think that way. My mind doesn't work that way. Um, and so, um, and, and, you know, and then of course, you know, Zen practice is a way of, you know, was another way that I, you know, um, learned to sit in that discomfort, you know, of, of um, you know, of not knowing, right. Um, but my, you know, just again, because of, you know, the way I was born, um, uh, you know, my, um, I, I'm drawn to storytelling and, um, and that's my, you know, that's my little talent. Right. And I think that's all we can do is we, you know, it, it's, it's crazy to think that I can save the world, even however much I might want to, you know, I, I would really love to save the world, but none of us can. Um, it, it's not how it works. So um, I think what we do is we learn to sit with the discomfort of that, you know, of, of our limitations. And yet we do our best. Um, and there's a wonderful quote by um, an Italian uh, philosopher, Gramsci, who you probably know about, um, Anton Antonio, I think is his first name, um, who uh, was imprisoned for um, 11 years by Mussolini's, you know, um, during, you know, the time of Mussolini. Um, he was a Marxist philosopher. And, um, and he eventually, you know, his 11 year imprisonment ended up ended up being his death sentence um and uh he died you know like a week after he was released from prison um and he had this wonderful phrase which is um uh pessimism of the intellect optimism of the will right and and that's an interesting phrase i think that's something i've i've thought about because um you know you're right we have all the you know we have all the um uh, you know, the information, we have so much information, you know, telling us that, you know, that the world is collapsing, right? Um, we've never had more. Um, and, and so intellectually, how can you not feel pessimistic, right? But at the same time, you know, because we are here, and because we get to have these human forms for a brief period, you know, we have to, we have to do what we can. And, and that's just our, I think that's our, you know, that's our vow. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. That's the will. Yeah. That's the yes, vow. exactly. 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 And I'd never, I didn't, I hadn't thought about that, but you're right to translate that into from Marxist terms into Zen terms. <laughs> that's exactly it. It's beautiful. Thank you. But then even small things. And I think that's where we, we get back to the reverence for everything. When you, emailed me, I think, or called me about the trees. Can you talk oh. a little bit about that? So doing a ritual, doing that kind of engagement yeah. is your way. And you can do that. And we can all do that in, in whatever presents itself. The point is we have to return to emptiness in order to hear the voices that are true, that, that can lead us to an action that doesn't just become a reaction. Yes, yes. The nobility and that comes from that vow. And, and that's what you were doing. Tell, tell everyone about yeah. it. Yeah, well, we had an unfortunate situation on our block right outside here um, this summer where the city of Northampton for um, budgetary reasons, uh, they, they had extra money in their, their paving budget. And they decided that our street was 
um, fit exactly the parameters. You know, it would cost exactly as much money as they needed to spend. Um, and so they were going to repave our street. And um, in order, you know, there's so much complication here, I'm not going to go into it, but in order to repave the street, um, some for some reason it necessitated um, cutting down this row of, uh, of beautiful old Japanese uh, Kwanzan cherry trees, right? Um, and, um, you know, and, and there were some, you know, it, it was a complicated, I, I don't want to simplify it. It was a very, very complicated um, uh, debate over this and, and, you know, a kind of um, nested set of uh, concerns um, surrounding the cutting down of these trees. Um, and, and there was a lot of obfusc obfuscation, you know, um, and we were, we were fighting it because these trees are, are really beautiful and they provided really valuable shade. And for environmental reasons, um, there was absolutely no reason to, you know, to cut them down, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, we got into a situation where we were just at loggerheads. There was no, you know, there was no way forward. Um, and uh, I was uh, talking to my friend, um, Greg Snyder at, uh, from Brooklyn Zen, Brooklyn Zen Center. And, um, and he, he just, you know, was telling, I was telling him about this and he said, oh, well, we'll just come over that, you know, their monastery is right across the border in New York, um, in, in Millerton. And he said, well, we'll just come over and, and uh, we'll do an ordination ceremony and we'll ordain the trees, right? And, and let's, let's shift the discourse here. Let's reframe this, right? Um, and, and so that's what we did. Um, you know, uh, he brought a whole, he bought a group of um, seven monks um, from the monastery over, and we performed a, a ordination of the, you know, of the trees, and it was beautiful. It was just beautiful, and it was, um, you know, a lot of people came, uh, you know, and then after that, we um, after after the trees were now, you know, newly ordained monks. Um, we wrote a letter to the city of Northampton, which was signed by, you know, I, I, every single yeah. Buddhist leader in this country and, you know, uh, uh, some abroad as well. I, I mean, really, it was like, you know, a hundred and at least you know, it was over 108 signatures on this on this um, on this document, which we then delivered to the mayor. Now, I wish I could tell you that after all this, there was a happy ending. Um, you know, there wasn't. Um, the city went right ahead in a militarized operation, came in with, uh, you know, uh, you know, cop cars, state police, you know, armed officers in flak jackets, um, you know, a, a whole crew of, of uh, you know, um, tree fellers with chainsaws and they, um, they came in and, and cut down the trees, even though at that point we had a restraining order um, in place as well. So it, it was a it was it did not turn out, uh, you know, it was not a happy ending. But having said all of that, um, there was still something that happened during that ordination ceremony um, that, as I, you know, as I mentioned before, it just shifted the context and reframed the, um, you know, the, the confrontation. And I think that was, you know, that was a val that was valuable in itself. Um, there was a little film made of this, and and so we're gonna, yeah, uh, you know, it, it, it's a beautiful thing to do, you know, because yes, insentient beings can be our teachers. They are our teachers, right? We just have to listen, <laughs> and um, and this is a way of of um, of saying that, of of performing that, you know, of of expressing exactly that relationship. Um, and, and their death can teach us something too, yes. you know, so, um, and yeah. here again, the outcome is not the point. Really. The outcome is not the point. Exactly. It was the, it was the, you know, people felt, people felt deeply consoled, you know, yes. angry, but still there was a, um, you know, there, there was a feeling of, um, yeah, just, it had become meaningful in a different way, you know. And, and I think this is something that, you know, the, the religious, you know, side of our lives um, has, you know, really, it seems been depleted and we don't have those rituals, you know, they're not easily accessible to us in the, you know, in our Western culture and our Western sort of, you know, capitalist culture. 
And I think this is something that as Zen practitioners, you know, this is something else we can do. It's a small thing, but, um, you know, we can offer that. So. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe time for one more question. Sure. Um, Thank you for this fabulous conversation. Ruth, you are so talented at expressing the inner lives of your characters. Aside from the process of self-interrogation that you described, I wonder how else you prepare to write such complete characters. What research or creative processes do you engage in? Hmm. I don't know whether I do anything special. Um, I give myself a lot of freedom to, um, you know, um, just to wonder about things. And um, and again, I think this this practice of you know keeping the pores open, keeping the sense gates open, you know. Um, if something kind of catches my interest, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll move towards it and, and try to find out more, you know, I, I might not, I might not know if it's going to be useful or how it's going to be useful or whether it's going to be useful. It's not a teleological process. It's not outcome oriented, you know, um, it's just curiosity, right? And um, so, you know, the snow globes is a, is a kind of a good example, it, you know, um, I, I spent a long time on eBay, you know, shopping for snow globes because that's what Annabelle was going to do, right? Um, Annabelle has a real thing for, um, for Michael's, you know, the, the arts and crafts superstore. Um, I am guilty of spending, you know, time wandering up and down the aisles of Michael's because Annabelle would have liked to do that. Um, you know, it, it's not an efficient way of writing. Um, but it's, you know, it's a way that, uh, that has worked for me. Um, and, and I think that's true for, you know, for all of the characters. And, and one thing that's, you know, that's been interesting, um, is some characters will create, you know, will pose, um, you know, a greater challenge. And so, you know, Annabelle was one of these and for all of the reasons that I explained, um, other characters too, though, um, the characters who are perhaps not so nice, you know, the kind of villainous characters, those are characters I think who you, you know, you really have to um, work with because if you can't find um, some love for them, you know, some connection, some, uh, yeah, some connection. Um, I wondered about that, that with the landlady's son. Yeah, right, exactly, exactly. And, and he was not a very nice character, you know, but, but when I just, you know, sat there and, and thought about him and thought about his life and, you know, allowed myself to daydream, you know, it's really a kind of daydreaming, right? Um, you know, little by little, you know, you sort of slip into the body mind of that character. Um, and, and this is a, this is something that I, I do very consciously too. Um, and, and I, again, teach my writing students this and it's a sneak, it's a way of kind of sneaking a little kind of mindfulness and Zazen into the writing process. Um, but I um, tell them about the sense gates, you know, um, the, the six sense gates. And, um, and then we do a kind of meditation, you know, we, we do a guided meditation where, um, you know, I lead them through awareness of all of the sense gates. And, um, and then I, ask them to remember the feeling of, you know, of dropping into your body and, you know, moving through the senses, right? And noticing what's coming in, what's, you know, what's, what's going out, what's far away, what's close, what's inside, what's outside, is there a difference, you know? And we, we go through all of this, you know, in these bodies here in the classroom. Um, and then I, ask them to try doing the same thing with their imaginary characters so that they will enter the character of say the landlord's son right and um and you know it's a kind of daydreaming you know closing your eyes and dropping into the body of the character yeah. um and you know feeling 
again, going through the sense gates and looking around and seeing what that character might see, touching his face, feeling the roughness of his birthmark, um, you know, uh, looking out the window and seeing the, you know, the clutter and the crows in Annabelle's backyard, you know, and, and you know, sort of do it in a very, um, you know, in a very mindful way. And, you know, when, when you do that, you become, you know, intimate with that character, even though the character might not be somebody who you originally liked very much. Um, and so I encourage my students to kind of play with that, um, that very kind of somatic way of entering the character so that the, you know, what you end up with, what you end up writing, what, what comes out onto the page is a more embodied kind of writing. Um, so that's, that's technically how, <laughs> that's technically how I do it. <laughs> Wonderful answer. Yeah. Any, should we take another question or? Sure, we can. Yeah, I, if there's time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, one last one. one. One last one, sure. Okay, this, this one, um, someone asked, is that a lunar globe behind you, Ruth? Yes. And could you discuss? Ah, a very <laughs> important Thank you. character. This is a book. wonderful, <laughs> this is a wonderful, wonderful thing that you just, um, yes, you just pointed to. This is indeed a lunar globe, okay? And um, the way that, so this, this globe plays a very important role in the book. And um, again, it just goes back to, you know, this idea of kind of porous, the porous walls of the, the book. When I moved into this house um, in 2015, the house was, shall we say, inadequately cleaned. And um, so I spent a long time cleaning it. And up on a tall shelf, was I, I was, you know, sort of reaching up to dust it. And I found a, a poster that had been, you know, that was left up there by the previous owner. And it was a poster of the Apollo 11 astronauts. It was this very weird kind of like souvenir poster of the, you know, the astronauts. And this, of course, fit my, you know, this, this had to go into the book, right? The Apollo 11 moon landing had to go into the book somehow. Um, and so I, again, went down the rabbit hole and started looking for just, just wandering and following, you know, my nose. And, um, and that led me to, uh, this, to this idea of lunar globes. And um, I went on to, uh, again, eBay, and I, um, I found this one. And it, it's just a beautiful object. Um, I, you know, it's, it's, I can't really show you, but, um, you know, it's, it's just this beautiful, beautiful object. And what happens is that Benny and Annabelle and his mother, well, his father, uh, Benny's father, Kenji, gives Benny this globe. And, um, and they end up playing a game with it, um, spinning the globe and um, landing on craters, right? And then making up stories about the craters. Um, and the craters, you really should look at the, you know, at the names of the lunar craters. They are so beautiful. Um, you know, this is the Lake of Dreams, the Sea of Serenity, the Sea of Rains, right? The Bay of Dew, uh, the Ocean of Storms. Um, you know, they're just the most poetic. Like who, who named these, you know, the, these, the, the Sea of Tranquility, of course, which is very famous, right? Um, the Sea of Fertility, right? Beautiful. Um, and so anyway, yes, the moon ended up, you know, entering the story, which of course made perfect sense because, you know, uh, to some extent, you know, the story is about a boy who is having unshared experiences um, and he's diagnosed with a mental illness, right? Um, he's diagnosed as being schizoaffective having schizoaffective disorder and is, you know, then falls into, you know, this kind of psychopharmaceutical um, world, right? And, um, and, and so it's about, you know, it's about lunacy, right? It's, there's this, you know, I was playing with this idea of madness, right? And is madness a gift? Is it, a, you know, is it, a, is it a, you know, a medical condition that, you know, that should be treated like a physical, you know, um, uh, ailment, you know? what, where does it lie, right? Because there are a lot of people who hear voices who, 
you know, they're not bothered by them and, and, you know, they coexist with them. And, and, um, you know, oddly enough, you know, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung both heard voices, right? The fathers of the fathers of modern psychiatry, right? Um, so anyway, it's, it's a, that's part of, that's one of the questions that's being asked in the book. And, and that's the, the globe kind of moved in and, and took up a, a place <laughs> in the story. <laughs> so glad that you got that last question. I know, that was beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this, Ruth. It's just been really just deeply moving for me to go through the book again and to be with you this way and to share this with so many people. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to do this too. You know, it's not often that I get to talk about the book in this way, you know, um, I talk about it from a place of practice. And, and so this is, you know, this is really special for me and I, I'm just so grateful and thank everyone for, for, you know, for coming. <laughs> thank you so much. Take good care. Thank you. You too. <laughs>